Hi there, this is Robert Thibodeau of the Mayflower Bookshop, mayflowerbookshop.com, and Mayflower Bookshop in Berkeley, Michigan. You can find me also on YouTube with songs and talks. Okay, I'd like to continue with Foundations of Esotericism. Many of you have asked me to continue reading and explaining a tough book that I may have even convinced you to buy. It's called Foundations of Esotericism by Rudolf Steiner. It's a series of talks that Rudolf Steiner gives as when he's the head of the Esoteric School of Theosophy of H.P. Blavatsky. Now, in the Theosophical Society, of which Steiner was a leading member in the European section, and rumored to possibly be the next president of the World Theosophical Society at the time, before... He had a separation with Annie Bestant and Leadbeater, which is a whole nother story and complicated. But he had to go on and do his own thing. And perhaps, in my thinking, Rudolf Steiner is the continuation of the Theosophical movement. And and he, certainly he explains uh, many things in Theosophy and the Isis Unveiled by Blavatsky and the Secret Doctrine. He He can really explain it well. So the Foundations of Esotericism is... Uh, His explanation of the esoteric school of Blavatsky, esoteric school of theosophy that you can find in her collected writings and you can find it independently printed. It used to be secret. And of course, the Theosophical Society, you could ask to join the esoteric school of theosophy. But within that school, they also had a secret group called the Inner Group. And Steiner's first class very well could be based or a metamorphosis of this school of not only early Freemasonry and early initiation systems of three degrees, but also his first class, Rudolf Steiner's first class, was meant to be three degrees, of which he only finished the first degree, gave a couple indications of further degrees, and and it was just left at that. So these esoteric papers are early Rudolf Steiner. He's still in the theosophical groove, Theosophy, meaning the wisdom of God or the wisdom of deity, possibly, and the wisdom of coming to the the, the solar logos of day, the sun, the sun Christos. And I'll continue now. This time I'd like to read chapter four, and I'll pause every once in a while to give you what I think might be an insight. It may or may not help. Hopefully it will. So... <clears throat> Foundations of Esotericism, Lecture 4, Berlin, September 29, 1905. We have spoken about the consciousness of the different kingdoms of nature. Man's organs have an organ consciousness. In idiots, this consciousness develops an abnormal condition. It is the consciousness possessed by nocturnal insects, ants, spiders, and so on. We find a totally different consciousness in the case of bees. We will use the example of bees to show how one arrives at such truths and then can make use of them to find one's bearings in the world. In occult schooling is something completely different from our usual schooling. Occult meaning, of course, hidden or esoteric, inward, inner perhaps, but maybe it's the inner of the outer. That was me talking. Okay, back to Steiner. In occult schooling is something completely different from our usual schooling. It does not start with cramming into the pupils a great deal of educational material. In a strict occult schooling, the pupil receives no educational matter whatever, but is given a pregnant sentence filled with inner power. So it was also in earlier times. The pupil had to meditate on the sentence in a state of complete inner calm, through which, eventually, he became inwardly suffused with light, completely illuminated. When a person has advanced to the stage of seeing into his inner self, he can sink his consciousness into other beings. For this, he must have gained control of the point midway between the eyes and from there direct his consciousness downward into the heart. Then he can transfer his consciousness into other things. For example, he can then investigate what lives in an anthill. 
then he can also perceive the life of a beehive. Here, however, a phenomena presents itself which is otherwise not to be experienced on earth. In the way a beehive functions, one experiences something which is outside our earthly existence, something which is not found anywhere else on planet earth. Now what takes place on other planets cannot be discovered merely by thinking. Unless one is able to transfer one's consciousness into the life and functioning of a colony of bees, one cannot experience what is taking place on the Sun or Venus, for example. The bee has not gone through the whole course of evolution as we have. From the outset, it has not been connected with the same evolutionary sequence as other animals and the human being. The consciousness of the beehive, not of the single bee, is immensely lofty. The wisdom of this consciousness will only be attained by man in the Venus existence. Now I might add that we're on the fourth earth. Steiner calls the first four earths the Saturn evolution, the Sun evolution, the Moon evolution, and the Earth evolution we're on now and in the middle of. For a simplistic, very simplistic point of view, we could say that the Earth was not as physical as it is now and dense with minerals and bones, rocks. When, when the first Earth happened, the Earth that we have now was more subtle and as far-reaching as Saturn, and then as far-reaching as Jupiter and then Mars and now this Earth. And that's what Steiner calls the Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth evolution. We've contracted and we're at the turning point of time where we're going to expand and raise our consciousness and become more ethereal and subtle. And in the future Earth of Jupiter evolution, we won't have bones or rocks, be more subtle energies, fluidic and imaginative. And, and then comes the Venus evolution and then the Vulcan. So that's what he's talking about, this Venus evolution is a couple of Earths from now. And I also want to point out this idea that Steiner mentioned earlier of gaining control of the point midway between the eyes. This is called the single eye or the third eye. In a previous talk, I talked about what I consider and developed as the third eye or single... I'm sorry, the single eyes were between the eyes, right? On your forehead. But the single ear, the third ear, the single ear is in your heart. The word here is in heart and earth. It's our earth center. But that's another thing that we'll have to talk about later. But I want to point out how Steiner mentioned that you gain control of the point midway between your eyes and then direct your consciousness downward into the heart. That you... I, I teach you know, letting go of your breath and breathing your perceptions and emptying them into your heart. That's the same thing. The breath comes in the nose and you imagine your your eye entering the heart or melting into the heart. So, so the consciousness of, the, back to Steiner, consciousness of the beehive, not of the single bee, is immensely lofty. The wisdom of this consciousness will only be attained by man in the Venus existence. Then he will have the consciousness which is necessary in order to build with the substance which he creates out of his own being. Then he will have the consciousness which is necessary in order to build with a substance which he creates out of his own being. I might add that seems like what the bees are doing, right? So... <clears throat> in the case of the ants, they build the ant hill out of all sorts of things, but as yet build no cells. The building of cells is something absolutely different on higher planes. Through the transferring one's consciousness into the beehive, through taking on the Venus consciousness, one learns something entirely different from anything else on earth. The complete recession of the element of sex. With the bees... What is sexual is vested only in one queen. The karma sexuality is almost entirely eliminated. The drones are killed. 
Here we have the prototype of something which will actually be accomplished in a future humanity when work is the highest principle. It is only through the impulse of the Spirit that one gains the faculty of transferring oneself into the community of bees. In order to progress further, let us now come to a true concept of alchemy. As late as the 18th century, one could read in the German paper, Raschenzieger, articles on alchemy. Kortum, the poet who wrote Jabsiad, Jabsiad, something like that, was one of the most significant alchemists of the 18th century. At that time, a number of articles dealt with the so-called Urmatri, primal matter, bringing this into connection with the philosopher's stone. I just want to add that in previous talk, I talked about my lecture at the Anthroposophical Society in Ann Arbor and where I talked about the philosopher's stone as part of the Saturn evolution that is still present in our radical stillness. Okay, back to Steiner. Bringing into this connection primal matter with the philosopher's stone, Cortum, who was deeply immersed in these things, said at the time, to search for the philosopher's stone is very difficult, but it is everywhere. You meet it every day, are well acquainted with it. You make use of it constantly, but do not know that it is the philosopher's stone. This is an apt description. In nature, everything is ordered with infinite wisdom, with an infinitely wise economy. All living beings possessing kama, astrality, desire, animals and human beings and all etheric living beings. Plants are interrelated. We breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon, carbonic acid. <clears throat> the animals do this also. Now, if this were simply to continue, the air would soon be quite full of carbonic acid. But the plants assimilate carbonic acid and breathe out oxygen. Animals and human beings cannot live without plants and trees. Now, carbonic acid consists of carbon and ox oxygen. The plants retain the carbon and breathe out the oxygen. Man, on the other hand, takes in the oxygen and through his life processes transforms it into carbonic acid by uniting it with carbon. The plants build up their bodily form out of the carbon which they have retained. In earlier times, the appearance of the earth was quite different from what it is now. Then, even in this distinct district, there grew forests of gigantic ferns and horsetails. These disappeared. At first, the earth became covered with a layer of peat, the remains of the dead plants, then the former forests of fern and aquacetums, were transformed into the immense coal fields of the earth. The rock formations developed gradually, either from the plant kingdom or the animal kingdom. When one looks at a lump of coal, one can say to oneself, this was once a plant. If one were to go still further back, one would also be able to find the plants out of which rock crystals, malachite, and so on developed. The central zone of the Alps arose out of the prime evil plants before coal. A diamond is exactly the same as a piece of coal. Nature has created a diamond from a coal still older than that which we have today. This rock crystal also has arisen out of plants. Limestone is derived from plants. I'm sorry, uh, excuse me. Limestone is derived from animals. The juras, for example, consist of such an accumulation of calcium. They were previously covered by the sea and were formed from the cast-off shells of sea creatures. Thus the younger limestone mountains have arisen out of animals and the primeval rocks out of plants. The plant kingdom gradually passed over into the mineral kingdom. Everything solid on the earth has arisen out of a plant earth. This mineralizing process can be studied through the development of coal out of plants. The mineral kingdom in its present state of separation only came into existence during the fourth round. 
our earth now. After this, the entire mineral kingdom will be spiritualized by man. Uh, when Steiner says man, of course, he means man and woman, and he means human being, and the word man derives from manas, the mind, the, the thinking, the mind. <clears throat> According to Tibetan Buddhists, the true nature of the mind is clearness, empty, clear, capable of light. Okay, Steiner. He transforms it with the plow of his spirit. After this, the entire mineral kingdom will be spiritualized by man. He transforms it with the plow of his spirit. Everything that man does today, the entire world of industry, is the transformation of the mineral kingdom. When someone quarries a rock in order to use the stones for the building of a house, then he builds a cathedral. When someone quarries a rock in order to use the stones for the building of a house, when he builds a cathedral, all this changes the nature of the mineral kingdom by artificial means. In the fourth round, man can work upon the mineral kingdom in this way. With the plant, on the contrary, he can as yet do nothing of, it, of this kind. The whole mineral kingdom will be transformed by man. To a great extent, well, I just want to put it aside, probably it would be better transformed if it was by women rather than man, but I couldn't help a little bit of humor there. I understand that Rudolf Steiner used to always tell jokes uh, at the beginning of his talks and in, in his lectures and talks, and that the stenographers were, were worried that people wouldn't take him seriously, so they took the jokes out. This is my comment. Okay, so I have to, I'm going to have to like try to add, probably not as good as Rudolf Steiner's jokes, but I might have to try a wee bit of a joke every once in a while. So that was, <laughs> that was one. Okay, back to Steiner. The whole mineral kingdom will be transformed by man. To a great extent, this would be brought about by oscillating electricity, no longer requiring wires. Uh, an aside here, Rudolf Steiner's predicted many of the things that are taking place now. Here he's predicting um, electricity being transferred without wires. Uh, okay, so this is happening, or, or information. <clears throat> <clears throat> to a great extent, this would be brought about by oscillating electricity no longer requiring wires. Here man will be working right into the molecules and atoms. At the end of the fourth round, he will have transformed the entire mineral kingdom. I guess we're moving into the etheric, my comment. Okay, back to center. From the fifth round, fifth earth, onwards, man will do the same with the plant kingdom. He will be able consciously to carry out the process which is now carried out by the plant. As the plant takes in carbonic acid and builds up its body from the carbon, so the human being of the fifth round will himself create his body out of the materials of his environment. Sex will cease to exist. Man will then himself have to work on his body. Will have to produce it for himself. The same process of transforming carbon, which the plant now carries out unconsciously, will then be carried out consciously by human beings. He will then transform matter just as today the plant transforms air into carbon. That is the true alchemy. Carbon is the philosopher's stone. That is the true alchemy. Carbon is the philosopher's stone. Again, I just want to add that we're in the fourth earth and that the um, dark warmth of the Saturn evolution, the first round, uh, the physical side of that is carbon and the philosopher's stone, I, I would imagine. Okay, back to Steiner. The man of the 18th century who pointed this out was indicating the transformation which is now carried out by the plants and which later would be carried out by man. When from the higher planes one studies consciousness as its function in a beehive, one learns how later on man will produce matter out of himself. In the future, the human being will also be built up out of carbon. It would then be like a soft diamond. Uh, aside, perhaps this is something to do with the Diamond Sutra of the uh, Tibetan Buddhists and the Vajra Sutras, Vajrayana, the Vajra lightning boat of Zeus, that, you know, that we really have the fire of love. 
instead of fire that causes war and burns things, we have a higher fire <clears throat> of love, <clears throat> the diamond. <clears throat> it would be then like a soft diamond. Then one will no longer inhabit the body from within, but will have it before one as an external body. Today, the planets are built up in this way by the planetary spirits. From a being requiring a body produced by others, man will transform himself into a being who manifests himself through emanation. At that time, he will consist of three members. Man in the evening, who goes on three, as the Sphinx says, the original four organs have undergone metamorphosis. At first, the hands were also organs of movement. Then they, will, they became organs for the spiritual. In the future, only three organs will remain. The heart as bodhi, bodhi organ, the two-petaled lotus flower between the eyes, and the left hand as the organ of movement. This future state, also related to Blavatsky's indication, H.P. Blavatsky, of a second spinal column, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland organize a second spinal column, which later unites itself with the first. The second spinal column would descend in front from the head. I just want to comment that the Sphinx asked the question, what is it that has four legs in the morning, two at noon, and three in the evening? So you might say that this is a whole new way of explaining, and I'm interpreting it, of course, my own way, in the hermetic, anthroposophical, theosophical, Rosicrucian way, that the four the man who has four legs in the morning is the physical, etheric, astral, and the ego. Without the higher self, see? The ego is bound up with the physical, emotional, mental, or the physical, etheric, astral. The, the ego, the fourth earth, is bound up with the first three earth productions. And doesn't have this, these next three earths, these, this higher triad that I've often talked about in these other talks. And so then the two is we have the microcosm and the macrocosm, or the inner and outer, or the higher and lower. As we become an adult, we have like spiritual material uh, self that we're kind of unconsciously reconcil reconciling the opposites or holding the tension of opposites or being crucified between spirit and matter, basically. The intermittently clapping rocks of Jason going home or Odysseus, we, we, we're stuck between spirit and matter. The inter intermittently clapping rocks. It's not an audience clapping, although sometimes it is. Okay, that's another humorous joke in case... Okay, <clears throat> so... But I want to say that then in the evening when you have three legs... See, they used to say that it was like a, a staff or something or externalized spinal column, or you have a, a will that you've developed. But I'm saying, too, that the, that three legs at the end in evening and sunset is the Atma Buddha Manas. It's a spirit soul body completely awakened with the universal mind and universal love and universal truth. This is Robert Thibodeau of Mayflower Bookshop adding his take on his friend, the good friend Rudolf Steiner. I used to have dreams of visiting him actually when I was young, theosophist living at the Theosophical Society and, and then became like a member of the Anthroposophical Society and hung out with those guys. Okay, and women. Okay, so let's continue with Rudolf Steiner. I'm sorry for that little explanation. For some of some of you like those things, and some of you want me to get keep going. Okay, I get I'm getting the point. Okay, so let's keep going. From being, um, then one would no longer inhabit the body from within, but will have it before one as an external body. I wonder if it's like a puppet or something. Okay, external body. Today, the planets are built up in this way by the planetary spirits. The planetary spirits like are outside and permeate that I'm I'm adding the planet. K. Steiner. From a from a being requiring a body produced by others, man will transform himself into a being who manifests himself through emanation. Star Wars. Okay. At that time he will consist 
of three members, quote-unquote, man in the evening who goes on three, as the Sphinx says. The original four organs have undergone metamorphosis. At first, the hands were also organs of movement. Then they became organs for the spiritual. In the future, only three organs will remain. The heart, as buddhi organ, the two petaled lotus flower between the eyes, that must be manas, and the left hand as the organ of movement. Atma? I'm adding, I wonder. Okay, Steiner. This future state is also related to Blavatsky's indication of a second spinal column. The pineal gland and the pituitary gland organize second spinal column, a second spinal column, which later unites itself with the first. The second spinal column will descend in front from the head. To arrive at such guiding threads as these, one must bring one's consciousness into a state of being which is at a higher level than we normally have at the present stage of earthly evolution. All this was taught in the mystery schools and in a certain way put to practical use. One must accustom oneself to developing one's way of thinking and then one will develop in oneself a feeling that nothing is valueless but that everything has its own inherent value. There is nothing in all nature that we can obliterate through thinking without thereby disturbing nature as a whole. The anthill also has a much higher consciousness than present-day man. The consciousness of the anthill is to be found in the higher regions of the mental plane. On the other hand, the consciousness of the bees is to be found in the higher regions of the booty plane. How then did the ant consciousness enter into our earth? This took place through beings who stand higher than we do, who had already gone through the process of creating their body for themselves. Males, females, and workers, the three members of the anthill, comprise the body of a higher spiritual being. The human spirit also comes gradually to the point of dividing itself into three parts, willing, feeling, and thinking become separated in the case of the esoteric pupil. The molecules of the brain divide into three groups. The esoteric pupil must then, out of himself, connect a definite feeling with a mental picture. In order to experience pity when he sees suffering, he must consciously add this feeling to it. To the front of the head lies the thinking part. On top, the part of feeling. To the back of the head, that of willing. To the front of the head lies the thinking part. On top, the part of feeling. To the back of the head, that of willing. The esoteric pupil learns to bring these consciously into connection with one another. Later, these three parts become completely separated. He must then control the three parts in the same way as an ant heap controls the males, females, and workers. Steiner refers to this part of thinking, separation of thinking, feeling, willing. He talks about this in Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and Attainment and uh, there's a reference coming up to Light on the Path by Mabel Collins at the Esophical Intuitive Inspirational Work. Now we must ask why higher beings manifest themselves in an anthill. <laughs> well, if formic acid had not been introduced, the whole earth would have been different. The foreseeing wisdom of higher intelligence was aware of the moment when formic acid had to be brought into the earth. We can thus gain a comprehensive understanding of the whole earth so that we know and recognize what lives and has its being within it. This was the case with per Paracelsus, who built up his concepts in such a way that he was able to perceive how things could be used as remedies because he knew in what relationship they stood to man and his organs. For instance, foxglove, the plant, is connected with the heart and can therefore still be rightly used as a heart remedy. 
Nowadays, new remedies are sought by means of experiment in which one tests their efforts on a number of people. In those days, remedies were sought through intuition because their interconnections were observed. Remedies discovered in this way always retain their effect, whereas with the others in the course of time after effects usually show themselves, which elude observation when the experiments were first carried out. This ends Lecture 4 of Rudolf Steiner's September 29, 1905 talk to the Esoteric School of Theosophy from the book Foundations of Esotericism. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was a very expensive book to find. Now been reprinted and available at the Mayflower Bookshop in Berkeley, Michigan, mayflowerbookshop.com. And this is Robert Thibodeau. Uh, happy to share with you this 32-minute reading with comments of Rudolf Steiner's Foundation Stone Meditation. I'm Robert Thibodeau. I'm an astrologer and astrological consultant and uh, speaker, lecturer on many a subject available at mayflowerbookshop.com and at Mayflower Bookshop in Berkeley, Michigan. Bless your heart. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it sparked you to study with us and learn with us in this uh, invisible school and college of the Mayflower Bookshop. Bless your heart.